The gospel attributed to Matthew was also written anonymously. The author did not sign his name to his work and left no indication of who he was. The consensus of modern scholarship is that the Apostle Matthew did not write the gospel attributed to him. An X in the anonymous box, please. It is also clear that the author, whoever he was, is certainly competent to provide testimony as he has, with great effort and care, copied our first witness's testimony almost in its entirety and verbatim in many cases and expanded upon it as well as edited some of the more troubling parts. We'll leave this box empty and move on. Matthew's Gospel is basically a rewrite of Mark's Gospel. Matthew copied over 90% of Mark to create his improved version. It offers little more by way of vivid eyewitness testimony, and further, no eyewitness would have merely copied almost all of another witness's account and much of it verbatim. It is quite clear that the author was not an eyewitness to the events. Thus, his entire testimony, being a revised and corrected copy of someone else's testimony, is rendered nothing more than hearsay about hearsay. And like the first gospel, we have nothing but later copies, no original, an X in the hearsay box, and off we go. Now, is the author of Matthew biased? Does he have something to gain? Most certainly. He's clearly pushing the idea that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, and in fact goes so far as to invent prophecy fulfillments by snatching even small fragments of sentences from the Old Testament and spinning a fanciful yarn around them. The story of Jesus escaping to Egypt in order to avoid Herod was built upon a single, out-of-context, misinterpreted sentence from Hosea chapter 11. Early in the morning were they cast off. The king of Israel has been cast off. For Israel is a child, and I loved him. And out of Egypt have I called his children. You have to admit that this is really stretching to see anything remotely Jesus-like in this first verse of Hosea 11. A person must be truly biased if he's seeing Jesus in this verse. There isn't even a mention of a son of God here. The children are actually the offspring of Israel, not God himself. If the author was in fact a Christian, there is bias present and far more than you might think. He expunged many problems with Mark's Jesus including the need for magic words and spitting on people in order to heal them. He also cleverly altered the idea in Mark that Jesus could do no great works in his homeland. Matthew alters it to say he would do no great works. I'll look at some of these in more detail in a moment. Matthew also added many fictional prophecy fulfillments, such as the one we just looked at, in order to bolster his case that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. Bias strong enough to make you invent prophecies from thin air and jerk Old Testament passages completely out of context gives us a check in the bias category. And we continue. Does our witness provide inconsistent statements? Does the Pope look like the Emperor in Star Wars? When our witness recounts the beheading of John the Baptist, we find that he is giving us not one, but two inconsistent statements. As his story begins, he calls Herod Tetrarch, which is correct. But as his story progresses, he refers to Herod as the king. These are inconsistent, as Herod was never a king. The second inconsistency involves Herod's feelings about killing John. At the start of the story, it is Herod who desires to kill John, and our witness claims that he was willing to kill him. Then, as our witness recounts that Herodias' daughter asks for John's head on a platter, the king is suddenly grieved. Why is Antipas suddenly a king, and why the sudden change of heart toward the Baptist? The reason, in my opinion, 
that we have these two conflicting ideas here is that Matthew was copying Mark's gospel as well as editing it as he went. And he simply succumbed to what is known as editorial fatigue. Matthew corrected his source, Mark, by changing the erroneous king to Tetrarch in the beginning of the scene, but lapsed into simple copy mode and forgot to correct the next instance of king. Also, Matthew seems to have merged Mark's account with that from Josephus, which has Herod willing to kill John but fearing the backlash if he did. This explains why Herod wanted to kill John in the start of the passage, Josephus' version, but grieved over the prospect of it in the later part, Mark's version. Editorial fatigue had set in, causing Matthew to be unable to sustain his earlier corrections throughout the scene. We can easily stop here and put an X in the inconsistent statements box, but let's look at one or two more examples. Our witness informs us that Jesus was born of a virgin and that the populace at large would refer to him as Emmanuel. But we know that Jesus was not named Emmanuel, but Jesus. And even if we take the passage to mean a simple referring to, we never see Mary referring to Jesus as Emmanuel. Further, even if we relax the interpretation more to allow Isaiah 7.14 to mean the populace in general will call him Emmanuel, there is no mention of this at all in Matthew's account beyond the claim itself. However, Jesus is called everything but Emmanuel in the testimony of our witness. He's called Jesus, Christ, Son of David, Son of Man, Lord, Savior, but never Emmanuel or even God with us. In fact, nowhere in the entire New Testament is Jesus referred to as Emmanuel. Our witness has relied on a faulty translation of the Hebrew known as the Septuagint. This was a second century BCE Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures. Let's put the Septuagint up and a proper translation underneath and you'll quickly see why our witness erred. The correct translation is that a young woman will conceive and bear a son as opposed to a daughter. If a son is born rather than a daughter, the sign is true. The sign was a sign to Ahaz. Further, it seems that the mother will name him Emmanuel and not the populace at large, which comes from the thou that does not appear in a correctly translated version. Not only this, but to further prove that Isaiah was not prophesying a virginal birth, just a few verses later, Isaiah himself has sex with the young woman in question, and she conceives and brings forth a son. This was an entirely natural childbirth, and it already occurred during Isaiah's lifetime. The Hebrew word for young woman is Alma, but the Septuagint rendered it Parthenos, which means virgin, never having had sex before. So we can easily see how Matthew blundered. He was unable to read the Hebrew scriptures in Hebrew. So it looks like we have several inconsistencies here. One is that Jesus was not referred to even once as Emmanuel in any New Testament writing. Two, the Isaiah passage clearly and indisputably refers to a natural childbirth that already occurred during Isaiah's day, thanks to Isaiah himself. Three, we learn more about this child from Isaiah than Matthew lets on. For example, the child in the Isaiah prophecy, quote unquote, is also called Meir Shalal Hashbaz. But you certainly don't find anyone in the New Testament calling Jesus that, do you? Last example, our witness gives an incorrect attribution for one of his prophecies. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, and the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced. Perhaps Matthew was thinking about this passage from Zechariah. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver, and the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. 
And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Our witness apparently doesn't even know what prophet he's quoting, even though the scriptures are right there in his lap as he works on his testimony. Yet we are to consider him a reliable witness? I think not. Many more inconsistencies and errors could be cited concerning our witnesses' claims and what we know about the Hebrew Scriptures and science, but let's just stop here. We'll put an X in the box and move on. Truthfulness would tend to require that a witness not say something they knew was not true. Gee, was that too many knots? Anyway, Let's see if we can spot any untruthfulness in our witness's testimony. 